said it's go time, we made them standard. We didn't fool around, we just implemented them. In the next 50 years, I would imagine that all cars will have, whether it'll be airbags or some other, some type of interior safety system to, to protect the occupant from impacts in any direction whether from the rear, front, or side, or even rollovers. Safety has gone from being almost a taboo subject to being not only mainstream, but actually attractive to a lot of manufacturers and a lot of cars. This sporty little red car is a rolling safety laboratory. Volvo calls it the SCC, or safety concept car. It's packed with technology you'll be seeing in your car in the future. The technology will be transparent. It'll just enhance the driving experience. The forward collision warning radar tells your cruise control when you're getting too close too quickly. Maybe you're getting drowsy and you're all of a sudden approaching a vehicle very close. We will have a system that will alert you audibly and visually, but as you proceed towards this vehicle, we may start applying the brakes. If the sensors no longer detect the vehicle in front, your car would accelerate back to its selected speed. The lane-changing aid senses when someone is approaching in your blind spot in the next lane and lets you know before you make a mistake. And there are cameras all over the car to better see your side angles directly behind you and what your kids are up to. What we want to create is a car that there's no surprises when you move around a situation. The SCC is designed specifically to help you see out of the car better. The unique feature is that when you sit in the car, there's an eye sensor that looks for the whites of your eyes and brings the seat up to a position that we know is the best for you to be able to see out of the car. Everything will adjust to your perfect driving position. The seat, the floor pedals, the steering wheel, and even the gear shift. Once in position, blind spots will disappear. What is known as the A pillar is partially transparent so you can see through it. The usual over the shoulder blind spot caused by the B pillar is also reduced by 25% because the pillars bend inward. Such a design also adds protection in a rollover accident. The advanced light system uses sensors to automatically adjust headlights to changes in the road. And the active night vision system will help you see in the dark and prepare the car to react before you do. The next stage of the active night vision system where I could see with clarity what's happening on the roadway, now can I analyze what's happening on the roadway and then warn the driver similarly and then control some of the safety features we have inside the vehicle. The experimental F400 carving is Mercedes rolling laboratory. The name carving says it all. It's like a slalom skier carving turns down a tight course. Its main safety feature is its steering system, called active camber control. When cornering, the car's outer wheels lean into the bend at an angle up to 20 degrees, increasing stability and reducing the danger of spinning. The tilt angle is controlled by a drive-by-wire system, which measures speed, acceleration, steering turning, and lateral forces. Then, its active hydro-pneumatic system optimizes the suspension and shock absorption in line with the changing situation on the road, all at lightning speed. It also uses special tires that are asymmetrical, which means the inner area of the tread is slightly rounded off. When driving straight ahead, the outer tread meets the road. When turning, the inner tread is in contact. Mercedes says the system improves lateral force by as much as 30% to 1.3 Gs. It all adds up to handling cornering at higher speeds, more like a motorcycle than a car. One thing is clear. The high-tech car of the future will do everything it can to make our lives safer. But will we be giving it too much responsibility? The driver is really the most important safety feature. We can do a lot. We can add more and more technology, but it's the driver. I think there was a natural backlash to giving over too much control to technology. We like technology to offer us conveniences and safety measures, but I don't think very many people yet are ready to sort of turn over control of the vehicle to a microprocessor and just become a passenger. We like to drive. If we didn't, we could take a bus, take a train, take a plane. The National Highway Safety Administration estimates that in the U.S., the seatbelt saves over 4,000 lives and prevents over 100,000 injuries each year. Modern Marvel's Car Tech of the Future will return on the History Channel.
cars, and then there are sports cars. Close to the ground, wind in your face, the world seems to have a love affair with the sports car. Sports cars are meant to be driven, as opposed to passenger cars, which are meant to be ridden in. These are cars that, theoretically, their entire purpose is to entertain the driver and one very lucky passenger. And there's a lust factor, frankly, that you want to connect with, a certain freedom, a youthfulness, a time of life, an attitude toward life. Brands like Mustang, Corvette, Thunderbird come to symbolize something in all of our psyches, and that really doesn't go away. But it's not just about fun. Sports cars play an important role in the future of car technology. Since 1904, when Mercedes turned its first race car into a road car, cutting-edge innovations have been trickling down from the racetrack, going first into sports cars, and finally into regular passenger vehicles. The role of motorsport has been an immense provocator of technology improvement. Their engineers are in that gymnasium that's called motorsports. They're being exercised right up to the last tenth or millisecond to gain speed in handling, in power, in transmission, in electronics, in traction control, in braking efficiency, in everything that's related to the motor vehicle. Probably the biggest inroads of racing technology into traditional passenger vehicles is in the tires. Passenger car tires used to be really bad. You know, how often do you get blowouts and, and flats all the time? Uh, you, you go around a corner relatively slow and you hear the tires squeal. Today's passenger car tires are actually as good as race car tires were 20 years ago. Race cars exert tremendous gravitational forces and heat at high speeds. So tire makers have developed synthetic compounds that have excellent performance characteristics in a variety of racing situations. Furthermore, tread designs have been customized for dry or wet track conditions. Racing teams must choose the right tire for a particular track and weather conditions on a given race day. Like so many factors in racing, it's a science. Race cars have advanced aerodynamics and a lot of the lessons learned from developing those aerodynamics have been passed on to traditional passenger cars of today. Other things that come from racing are these onboard diagnostic computers that are continuously monitoring the functions of our cars. That kind of started out as the crew chief sitting on the side of the track with telemetry monitoring what's going on in the engine of that race car to keep track of that. While many production car manufacturers have participated in racing with varying degrees of success, fewer names are synonymous with both race and street cars. Perhaps none personify this idea more than the name Ferrari. Company founder Enzo Ferrari was relentless in his quest for perfection. He was single-minded. He was almost autocratical when it came to ruling his domain his Ferrari empire. Like many manufacturers before him, Enzo Ferrari took advances learned from his race cars and incorporated them into his sports cars. His methods followed a new axiom, race on Sunday, sell on Monday. He was a nut for racing, wanted to use racing to promote his cars, built cars principally for racing first, and then sold them to the public mostly as a way to fund his racing activities. That created a terribly attractive set of reasons for wanting a Ferrari. People who buy Ferraris now, in a very real sense, are buying in to Ferrari's Formula One racing activities, because the two really do go together. Ferrari's latest bid for supercar supremacy is the Formula One-inspired Ferrari Enzo a 660-horsepower V12 rocket that bursts from 0 to 60 in 3.1 seconds and has a top speed of over 200 miles per hour. Just as aerodynamics dominate their Formula One car designs, the Enzo's form follows the same function, to pierce through the atmosphere with the least resistance. Ferrari engineers had designed the car to be aerodynamically stable, 
They've used extensive wind tunnel tests to maximize airflow in order to optimize downdraft and drag forces. They've also borrowed electronic shifting controls from their Formula One cars that are mounted on the steering wheel so the driver's hands are kept where they're needed most. And the steering wheel even displays the tachometer's readings in a series of LEDs. The Enzo is as close to the Ferrari Formula One driving experience as an owner can get. The price tag, a cool $660,000. There is the Porsche. Dr. Ferdinand Porsche is credited with creating the Volkswagen Beetle in the 1930s. But his first namesake cars didn't debut until 1946. Since then, Porsche has built its reputation on its road cars. First the 356, then the 911 among others, as well as its race cars. Many times the winner of endurance races at Le Mans and Daytona. While the company's flagship has been the 911 Turbo, a brand new Porsche supercar has joined the ranks the Carrera GT. The Carrera GT represents the epitome of the company's illustrious track record for technical innovation. Like the 911 Turbo, the Carrera GT could compete on a racetrack with few modifications. Its suspension is tight, its center of gravity low, its carbon fiber body very lightweight, and its aerodynamics maximized. The rear spoiler is signature Porsche. It can be electronically raised for maximum downforce at high speeds. Combined with its integrated front spoiler, which keeps the front end from lifting at top speed, the Carrera GT makes the most of its 5.5-liter, 560-horsepower V10 engine. Top speed, a breathtaking 205 miles per hour. To slow down, Porsche has given the car its ceramic composite brakes. The ceramic brake disc is a specially treated carbon fiber material, cross-drilled and internally vented. The brake pad is a composite material. Together, they greatly reduce heat generated from hard braking and have optimum resistance to brake fade. Of course, all this technology, as well as its pedigree, is just as impressive a price tag, $440,000. In its first year, Porsche plans to build only 1,500 Carrera GTs. Champion driver Steve Celine whose Irvine, California company has built its reputation racing and customizing Mustangs and competition cars, is now building his own version of the car of the future. The $360,000 Celine S7 is a direct translation of racing technology adapted to street use. A lot of sports cars or supercars have really been developed out of racing. Our motorsports background has really enabled us to take almost 99% uh, of what we've learned on the racetrack and put it into our street cars. Every S7 is custom built by hand. Its 560 horsepower all aluminum V8 can hit top speeds in excess of 200 miles an hour. Its dynamic styling is made possible by knowledge gained in the aerospace industry. Aerospace is using a lot of exotic materials. Those materials are making their way now into passenger and production cars. The S7's body, for example, is 100% carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is as strong as aluminum and ultralight weight, and it can be formed in ways metal can't. This advantage is more than cosmetic. It's all about keeping the car glued to the road at high speeds. Its 64 air vents enhance the S7's aerodynamics. The vents funnel the oncoming air around and through the car, reducing drag and improving downforce. We have achieved a very elaborate system of vents and ducts that allow a continuous airstream throughout the whole car. That starts at the front, through what you see here with the vents and the ducting into an airfoil literally on the side of the car which then in turn channels it into the engine compartment and then back through the back of the car giving us the best aerodynamics of any production car on the road today. With a price tag of around $400,000, the power of the S7 will remain in the hands of a few. But Steve believes you're getting a glimpse of the future of everyday automobiles when you feast your eyes on his supercar. What we're really watching, and I think you'll see, is that the use of these materials and the layout and the way it gets adapted from the racing will eventually make its way into everyday passenger cars. 
And it just is a matter of time and a matter of cost before it becomes more and more prevalent.